Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sigma 500mm f5.6 DGDN, a light and compact super telephoto prime lens aimed at sports, wildlife, and aviation photographers. Announced in March 2024 and initially available in Sony E and Leica L mounts, it costs around $3,000 or £2,800. Price wise, this pitches it roughly between a variety of super telephoto zooms and super high end prime lenses while beating them all on portability. Size and weight are key benefits here, with the Sigma 500 5.6 being surprisingly small and light in person, measuring just 235mm long, 108mm in diameter, and weighing just under 1.4kg. That's actually shorter and only a tad heavier than Canon's legendary EF400 5.6, despite reaching 100mm further. It's seriously compact and lightweight for a lens of this focal length and aperture, and it's something that I found I could comfortably handhold and walk around with all day. I even managed to use it on my Faisal TT15 mini tripod. In comparison, Sigma's own 150 to 600 and 60 to 600 zooms may be a much more affordable way to reach 500mm and beyond, costing around $1,500 and $2,000 respectively, but both are dimmer at 500mm and crucially a lot heavier at 2.1 and just under 2.5kg respectively. Meanwhile, Sony's popular FE200-600 is another more affordable way to reach 500mm and beyond at around $2,000, but again, it's a more substantial proposition, longer at 318mm, heavier at 2.1kg, and again dimmer at 500mm. By now, you'll be understanding the USP of the Sigma 500 Prime. It may be more expensive than a zoom lens and obviously lacks their flexibility, but counters it with a slightly brighter aperture, shorter physical length and considerably lighter weight, not to mention with the promise of better optical quality. Suffice it to say, it's also a lot lighter and more affordable than the truly high-end f2.8 and f4 Super Tele Primes out there, thereby delivering an aspirational package without breaking your back. And while three grand can't exactly be described as cheap, it is around a quarter of the price of those mega lenses. Okay, now that's enough background, let's take a tour around the lens. Designed, manufactured and assembled at Sigma's Seoul factory in Japan, the build quality is excellent. The lens is made from what Sigma describes as a thermally stable composite material, which actually shares similar expansion properties to aluminium. The mount, control rings and switches are all dust and splash resistant, and includes a rubber grommet at the mount. As you'd hope, the lens is supplied with a tripod collar, and as always, bonus points to Sigma for carving an Arca Swiss dovetail in the foot, allowing it to slide right into compatible clamps. Other companies, please note and follow suit. This foot can also be removed to save a bit of weight, but I left it on to double as a handle, albeit quite a tight one for those with larger hands. The collar remains integrated though, allowing the barrel to rotate inside with useful notches and feedback at 90 degree intervals. Closest to the mount on the right here are four switches, the first for auto and manual focus. Below this is the focus limiter switch with three options, the full range, 10 meters to infinity for distant subjects, or 3.2 to 10 meters for the closer ones. Next comes the optical stabilization switch with two modes, the first for general use and the second one optimized for panning. Most bodies with IBIS can work alongside this optical stabilization, with the lens typically taking care of the X and Y axes, leaving the others to the camera. Below this is the custom switch with two banks. Like other Sigma lenses with the same capability, this allows you to fine tune the stabilization and the focus limiter options via the optional USB dock. This is, however, only available for L mount versions of the lens, so Sony owners will have to make do with the defaults, but they're fine. Positioned roughly midway along the barrel is a wide and very smooth free-spinning manual focusing ring, followed by a manual aperture ring that's closer towards the front of the lens. At first it looks a little bit odd to have this aperture ring so far from the mount, but it does make a lot of sense as this is where you're going to be supporting the lens when shooting. The aperture runs between f5.6 and f32 with a lockable A position for body base control. The aperture ring can also be clicked or de-clicked by a switch on the opposite side. Finally, towards the end of the barrel are three focus hold buttons, normally also customizable on most bodies. Unsurprisingly, for this focal length and aperture, the front of the barrel expands to accommodate the substantial first element, with an equally substantial 95mm filter thread at the end. Sigma supplies a clip-on plastic lens cap and a substantial cylindrical lens hood, which is held in place by a thumbscrew. 
Note the rubber tip around the end of the hood which allows you to stand the lens up on a flat surface with less risk of it slipping over. The depth of the hood also keeps the precious front element protected from more uneven surfaces and the hood itself can be reversed over the barrel for transportation. Sigma also includes a padded case for the lens with swappable foam bases depending whether you carry the lens with the hood reversed over the barrel or removed altogether. Like most cases for big lenses though, you will have to remove your camera body if you want to zip it closed. Sigma supplied the L-mount version for my review and I used the Panasonic Lumix S52X to test it. The optical results though should apply to the E-mount version for the Sony owners out there. Now one of the quirks of Lumix bodies is they sometimes slow down their photo autofocus when connected to an external HDMI recorder, which in turn makes it quite hard to demonstrate in a review like this. So anecdotally, I found that the focus speed was swift in use, limited pretty much by the subject recognition and the tracking of the body that you mount it on. I can however show you the effect of the optical stabilization in practice. Here I'm trying to frame a tree at the end of my garden, first without stabilization, before switching it on via the lens barrel and returning to a view that after a couple of seconds of settling down becomes much steadier. Next here's a more challenging situation where I'm actually holding the camera and lens high above my head to have a clear view of the bird through the branches. It's a pretty uncomfortable position with inevitable wobbles, but the optical stabilization still let me grab some sharp images. And now I've relocated to a different position where I could lean against a wall. It's still handheld, but clearly much steadier thanks to an extra point of contact. If you intend to pan the lens, I'd strongly recommend OS mode 2, otherwise the image can jump a bit as you reach the extremes. Next for coverage, and for comparison, I'll start with a view of Brighton Pier from my earlier review of the Sigma 50mm 1.4 DGDN art lens. So this shot represents standard coverage. And now here's what you're going to get from the 505.6 from the same position. Pretty tight, huh? I also scaled this image down to match the details on the 50mm version and found that I could fit in a fraction under 10 of them across the frame of that shorter lens. So that confirms the magnification difference. Most obviously 500mm is an ideal length for bird photography and distance sports, but I also enjoy the unique perspective super telephotos can deliver on urban views. The compression can be quite dramatic and I've got more examples to show you at the end of this video. It's also a decent length for solar and lunar photography. Now sadly the moon was elusive during my test period, but I did manage to grab some views of the sun at sunset. This could also make it ideal for eclipse photography and I've got separate videos which will show you how to photograph both solar and lunar eclipses if you're interested. If you want greater reach, the L-mount version of the lens is compatible with Sigma's 1.4 and 2x teleconverters, but sadly the Sony version of the lens won't work with TCs, at least not with autofocus anyway. This could be a reason for Sony owners to choose the Sony lens instead, which also tend to work better with their body's built-in stabilization, and they also support the fastest burst speeds. Sadly, like all third-party lenses, Sony bodies will limit their maximum burst speed. Or you could mount the lens on a camera with an APS-C sensor or exploit a cropped mode to deliver an effective focal length of 750mm. Now while crop modes will reduce the resolution of still photos, many modern cameras offer cropped video modes which can maintain 4K quality. To illustrate the extra reach in action, here's a still photo of the sun in full frame photo mode. And now for a short video clip filmed in 4K APS-C mode for a 50% boost in magnification. And this video was also handheld. This technique is also ideal for getting a boost on wildlife subjects. So here's that pigeon again with full frame photo coverage before switching to a 4K video version filmed in an APS-C cropped mode. As mentioned earlier, I was leaning against a wall here, but this was still handheld at 750mm equivalent. I'll show you some more videos later, but first let's check out the photo quality of the 505.6 on another portion of Brighton Pier. And since the view's already so tight, there's no need to angle it as I do with wider lenses. So now let's zoom into the middle of the image for a closer look with the aperture wide open to 5.6 where there's loads of fine details and nothing really to complain about. In my tests, I saw no benefit to closing the aperture any further for sharpness in the middle of the frame. So now let's head into the far corner and it tells pretty much the same story. The sharpness is maintained right into the extremes with the aperture wide open and again, there's no benefit to stopping it down in my tests, at least for sharpness. This represents excellent performance from the Sigma 500 and confirms its optical superiority over cheaper zooms. 
The quality is also maintained at closer distances, although the fairly modest minimum focusing distance of just 3.2 meters does somewhat limit the potential magnification compared to rival zooms. But regardless, here's an example taken near to the minimum focusing distance, allowing me to almost fill the frame with this bird. Let's now have a look at some more bird photos taken with the lens mounted on the S5-2X body, generally using zoned or full area autofocus with animal and human subject recognition. As the birds pass in front of various buildings, you'll see the potential for separation at f5.6. Sure, it's not going to be as great as on an f4 or 2.8 Super Tele Prime, but again, this lens is considerably lighter and cheaper than those kind of lenses. And if you're coming from the other direction, it may be more expensive and lack the flexibility of a zoom lens, but I greatly appreciated its considerably lighter weight when moving around, especially as it remained a hand-holdable prospect in many situations. My results from the 500 were also a little sharper and with slightly shallower depth of field effects than the best zooms out there. The Lumix S5 2X autofocus and tracking though was not as reliable or consistent as the Sony bodies I've tested, so L-mount bird photographers may want to try this combination before they buy. And now for my verdict, during which I'll show you some more sample photos and video clips that I made with this lens. The Sigma 500mm 5.6 DGDN is a very welcome super telephoto lens for those who prefer to use primes over zooms. It delivers a step up in sharpness and brightness over the big zoom lenses with a considerable saving in weight, making it tempting to anyone shooting distant subjects who greatly values portability. At just under 1.4 kilograms, it's so much easier to carry around than zooms, which include this focal length. And unlike those models, I found it possible to shoot all day, mostly handheld, without the need for a tripod or monopod. And while it lacks the ultimate separation of the F4 and 2.8 Super Tele Primes, it is considerably lighter and cheaper than any of those kind of lenses. But there's still no getting away from the fact that it is pricier than the big zooms, while also lacking their flexibility. Sigma's own 60 to 600 and 150 to 600 both extend beyond 500 mm, giving them greater compositional flexibility, while also costing two thirds and half the price, respectively. Likewise, Sony's 200 to 600 reaches further, has greater flexibility, and costs two thirds the price of the Sigma Prime. But all of these zooms are larger and weigh over two kilograms, where in the case of the 60 to 600, closer to two and a half kilograms, making them much less portable. When testing those lenses, I did love their flexibility and affordability, but I hated carrying any of them around for long. Now, what you're willing to carry around is a very personal thing, but those hefty zooms rooted me to mostly fixed locations and tripod or at least monopod use. In contrast, the Sigma 500 felt much more like a handheld lens. The irony being it may be less flexible as a prime, but you're more able to move freely with it. Ultimately, it's a mature market now with lots of choice, and I'm delighted Sigma has targeted the middle ground here, a little like Canon's old 405.6 and Nikon's more recent 606.3. All of these offer a taste of a bright Super Telephoto Prime without the cost and weight of those you see lugged around pro sporting venues. Once again, if your budget is tighter, just go for a zoom. But if the 500 length fits your subjects and you greatly value portability, I'd say it's worth spending the extra on this one. It's highly recommended. And that's it for this review. Let me know what you think in the comments and which super telephoto lens is best for your style of shooting. And if you found my review useful and you'd like me to make more of them, please do consider giving it a like and my channel a follow. It really helps. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.